Well howdy folks, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to have a little discussion about automation. And I'm going to walk you guys through some of the very basic building blocks of an automated system or an automatic system. And we're going to look at what happens when you put an electrical system in charge of a mechanical system. Okay, let's get to it. I'll try not to screw this up too badly, but I do feel pretty terrible today. Had a customer call in, kind of a Hail Mary, and I can still do two weeks worth of work in five days, but let me tell you, the consequences now are a lot more severe than they were a few years ago. So I think I'm going to have to kind of rein that in. Anyway, in order to help us understand these automated systems, I have built a test rig. And all this is is a few scraps of wood glued and screwed together. It's got a big DC gear motor right there. On top of the gear motor is a turntable and up in front are a few of these momentary contact switches. So right now I've got the circuit set up just like it's shown on the paper. Power comes in, goes through a momentary contact switch to the motor and to the ground. So when I push this button right here, this turntable is going to rotate and it's going to change from a picture of YouTuber and cast iron addict Brian Block to a picture of YouTuber and I'm guessing part-time Civil War reenactor Steve Summers. And that's all it does. So, can we really call this an automated system? I don't think so because it requires 100% operator interaction in order to do anything. So let's look at how we can make this into an automated system. So I've reconfigured our test rig and I added a timer. And this is a simplified schematic of what's going on. So basically the timer is a relay that turns on power to the motor. And the timer starts when I push that green start button. It's, it's ground side switched. So when I push this button right here, the motor runs for four seconds and then it stops. So when I come up to the machine, I'm tired of Brian, I want to see Steve, push the button, and the machine displays a lovely picture of Steve Summers. So this is an automated system at this point. I don't have to be here to babysit it. I push the button, the machine does everything on its own. But there's a problem with this control system. This is an open loop control, meaning that this timer right here cannot actually monitor the physical location of the turntable. All it can do is assume that the turntable is in the right location based on the amount of time that we've programmed into it. So let's say there was a slight variation in the incoming voltage and that's going to cause the motor to either run a little bit slower or a little bit faster. The timer is always going to be four seconds. So if we have a variation and we keep pushing this button enough times eventually we're going to have some error and those errors are going to be additive and we're going to end up all out of whack. So what we need to come up with is a closed loop control that can monitor the position of the turntable. Well, based on this rat's nest of wire, I'd say we're really getting somewhere. So, this is the schematic for what we're doing in this configuration. And basically what I've done, we're still using a relay, but instead of a timer, we now have a physical limit switch. And the limit switch is triggered by the turntable. So, what happens here is, when you push the start button, it bypasses the limit switch, and this first contact of the relay and it energizes the coil of this little ice cube relay right here. And this is called a latching relay. So basically when the relay coil energizes and the limit switch is closed, the contact of the relay will maintain power across the coil. So basically at that point the relay is latched and we can let go of this button and power will continue to flow through this circuit. And this is a double pull, double throw relay. So what that means is that inside of this relay there's a magnetic coil and that magnetic coil basically operates a mechanical switch. Now in a double pull relay there's two
two of those switches that are actuated by the same coil. So every time that the coil is energized, two physical switches are going to be moving inside of that relay. And what that means is that we can control two different circuits with one input. So this start button right here controls the latching circuit and it also controls this contact right here that turns on the motor. Now latching relays are a fundamental part of any kind of a logic or automated system. They're basically used everywhere. So let me show you how it works. We push the button. So what happens in this circuit when it comes to a stop is that the limit switch basically is pushed open and we lose power right here to the coil in the relay. When we lose power to the coil in the relay, these contacts both open up because they're normally open contacts. So one of the primary reasons that we use relays is that we can use very small wires, very low amperage and low voltage in our control circuit and we can control motors that require very high amperage and very high voltage. Uh, for all intents and purposes, the relay isolates this half of the circuit from this half of the circuit. Now at this point our automation is pretty decent. This is a closed loop system, meaning that the control circuit that we've built over here is able to monitor the physical location of the turntable and as a result we're getting much better repeatability on our stopping point right here. Now we could still have some variation. Let's say there was for whatever reason a voltage spike or something and it caused the turntable to go basically twice as fast as normal. You know it's going to drift quite a bit further before it actually comes to a complete stop. But what we're not going to get is that accumulated error like we had with the timer. Because with the timer, you know, let's say it's off by one degree every time that we push the button. You know, if you push the button 360 times, you lost a full turn. So with a closed loop system, that's much less likely to happen, especially if we can keep the speed of the turntable within, you know, some reasonable parameters. But all that being said, there's still some issues with this design. So number one, there's no way to stop it. So once it's going, I can't do anything to stop it other than actually physically remove one of these wires. The other problem is I have to hold down the start switch until the limit switch closes. So if I push it real quick and let off, you see how it failed to start? That's a function of the circuit, so the start switch bypasses this limit switch and basically allows the, the motor to start turning even though the limit switch is still pushed in. So what we need to do is come up with a way to further refine this circuit so that we don't have that little issue and also to add a stop circuit so that we can stop and interrupt the cycle anywhere that we want to. I know it looks like the makings of an electrical fire but it does work. Well this is the final circuit design and basically I had to use both the, the relay and the timer relay in order to accomplish all these different functions. So before you can really understand this you have to understand how the timer relay works. And this is the timer relay right here. It's a little Panasonic unit and this thing is pretty sweet. It's a programmable unit. It's got eight different functions. It can do all kinds of stuff. As you can see here you know flicker and differential, one shot, one cycle pulse on flicker. It's basically like a little PLC. So the two most common uses for a timer relay are what's called on delay and off delay. And on delay is the most common. So this is a timing chart right here that explains how it works. So basically what happens is that when you turn the coil on right here, the contacts wait a certain amount of time, T, before they actually react. So after time T has changed, the normally open contacts close, or if there was a normally closed contact, it would open. And then once power to the coil is removed, the contact closes or opens just like a normal relay. Now in an off delay situation, it's exactly the opposite. So when the, con the coil turns on, 
the contact closes and then once the coil turns off the contact waits a certain amount of time T before it turns off so for all intents and purposes they do the same thing but the, the time on delay is at the beginning of the cycle and the time off delay is at the end of the cycle so if we go back to our circuit I'll explain to you guys how this works what happens is when you push the start button power goes through this branch right here and it goes through the stop button that's this stop button right here which is a normally closed switch and powers up the coil of control relay CR1 that's this ice key relay right here and then at the same time it also powers up the coil of TR1 that's this timer relay and once the coil is energized it closes this contact and it provides power through this circuit right here but the limit switch is still open because it's stuck on this part of the ramp right here so in order to get around that we go through a normally closed contact of the timer relay and this is a time on delay relay so what happens is even though this coil has power this contact is not going to open up until the timer goes up to one second so when the CR1 relay closes it closes this contact and the motor starts to turn so the turntable here starts to rotate and then after one second this normally closed contact is going to open up and this circuit is no longer able to carry electricity but by that time the limit switch has already physically closed and there's no interruption in the path of this circuit right here so I really hope that makes sense if you guys don't understand how to read these electrical schematics, I'll link to a video that I made a while back that explains how to read an electrical schematic. And, you know, basically you have to remember that components that are wired up in series are considered AND. So you need CR1 and LS1 and stop in order to power CR1. Components that are wired up in parallel are considered an OR. So you need CR1 and LS1 or TR1 in order to get power from this point to this point. So you would need power, you would need start or CR1 and LS1 in order to get power to this point. That's, that's logic, ladder logic. So now that we've muddled our way through all of that, let me show you some of the drawbacks of this type of a system. Because remember, nothing's ever perfect. So let's say that we hit the button right here and we choose to stop it right here just before the limit switch contacts the next ramp well if I hit start right now the limit switch is gonna trip out right here when it gets to the corner of this of this ramp but there's still this closed contact here from the timer relay and it's set for one second so even though the limit switch is gonna open up right here it's still going to require the motor to turn for one second from the time I push this button. So you see what happens, we overshot our mark. But if we hit the button again, and we let it go through its natural cycle, the next time it ends up being in the correct position. Now the other very common problem with a system like this has to do with the timer relay. What always happens is that some moron comes along and for whatever reason he cranks this thing up to 11 so let's say he just set that timer relay for I don't know six five six seconds and walked away didn't say anything to anybody and now you come along and you push your button and you want to switch from Steve to Brian uh oh we skipped Brian we went right back to Steve what happened? Well, if we look at the schematic, what happened is that the time delay on here was turned up to five and a half seconds. So it held this normally closed contact closed for so long that it actually bypassed one whole section of the turntable and totally ignored the input from the limit switch. So if we turn the timer relay back down to one second, everything goes back to working normally. 
So I, I hope it's clear from that little demonstration that the time base of the timer relay is extremely important. If something happens to this time base, it, it can cause all kinds of crazy, unpredictable problems with your control circuit. And you'll be sitting there scratching your head trying to figure out what in the world is going on. Why is it not doing what you expect it to do? And like I said, this is a digital, you know, programmable timer relay. Everything inside of here is done with integrated circuits and, and ones and zeros. These things are extremely, extremely reliable. But they weren't always built this way. So before we had digital timer relays, we had mechanical timer relays. And I've worked on a lot of machines, older machines, that had mechanical timer relays that didn't work right. The problem is, inside of the actual relay, there's a mechanical clockwork mechanism. And it mechanically counts up or down. And what usually happens with them is the clockwork gets sticky, or I've seen them where they, they'll work fine in a vertical orientation, but then you turn them on their side, and all of a sudden, everything just goes all crazy. And I, I thought I had one around here. I can't put my hands on it. I don't know what I did with it. I used to have one of those old mechanical Allen Bradley type of, of time delay relays. And there's a uh, clockwork mechanism that you can take off and you actually flip it around 180 degrees and in one orientation it's a time on and the other orientation it's a time off and those things are very very unreliable uh, I work on a lot of older Devlig machines they're chock full of mechanical timer relays and I would say that the most common request that customers have when I go to work on the Devlig machine is to replace the mechanical timer relays with a PLC or with digital timer relays. So I've seen that mechanical timers used in other types of automation too. I worked on a drill press one time that was just chock full of pneumatic timers. That was an absolute nightmare. So I've seen all kinds of problems with Devlig machines using these timer relays. I could tell you story after story. One time I worked on one where the the customer was saying that basically when they stopped the spindle it would stop and then it would start up again in reverse same thing when you went forwards or when you went reverse so you start the spindle in reverse and then you stopped it and it would stop and then it would start back up again in forward could not figure out what was going on with it finally what I figured out was that they were doing uh, plugging to stop the spindle so basically what they were doing was they were just reversing the polarity of the motor in order to stop it quickly so three phase motor and they're just switching one of the legs to, to try to reverse the motor and it has a timer relay that controls that it basically just switches the polarity for like half a second so it stops the spindle well the timer went wonky and it was holding the thing reversed for like five seconds so it would stop the spindle and then it would ramp it up in the opposite direction so once we figured out that the time base was wrong on the timer relay it was no problem to fix that issue uh, I worked on another Devlig one time where the spindle wouldn't turn on and when you push the spindle start button on a Devlig what it does is it powers up a hydraulic pump and that provides power or, or pressure to all of the clutch packs for the you know the different gearbox ratios or whatever so it makes sure that it's in gear before it starts the spindle and then after a certain amount of time the hydraulic pump is supposed to stop and the spindle is supposed to start well guess what controls that time a timer relay and the, the stupid thing had failed and the customer had replaced it but when they put it back together they they put the timing timing mechanism in backwards and instead of being a time off delay it was a time on delay or or vice versa so I spent you know several hours trying to figure out why this thing wouldn't work and you know the customers tell me that they already replaced the parts well they had replaced the parts but they hadn't put them in correctly okay guys I think I've droned on for long enough and <laughs> I killed the better part of a whole day making this stupid video so I hope it comes out okay hopefully when I go to the editing process I don't find out that everything I said was wrong and and totally nonsensical Th these are fairly complicated topics but when you break it down you know the individual components are pretty simple timer relays are pretty simple you know, regular control relay is very simple, you know, switches, stuff like that. Very simple components. It, the challenge is figuring out how to make them all work together in a way that gives you robust control and lets you do the cool things that you want to do. 
how else would you make a sweet machine like this that can display a picture of a good looking gentleman like Brian Block or Steve Summers and I probably should have asked those guys you know for permission to use their pictures before I made this video but you know better to beg for forgiveness than ask for permission I always say I'll put a link to both of their channels and you know, maybe a card or whatever up here in the corner I'm sure if you know about me you know about them you know they're making great content putting it out there for everybody to see so hopefully they'll be stopping by the video to leave their two cents and if you want to leave your two cents go down to the comment box and tell me what you think you know this is pretty common stuff in the industrial world you don't see timer relays or, or really ladder logic being used in the automotive sector pretty much everything's done with computers uh, they're just using relays more as like high capacity switches but in the industrial world timer relays are still used all the time you see them like on Y delta starters for big motors you'll see them on like lube pumps you'll see them on various types of interlocks you know because they, they give you a little bit of time to get the thing closed before the, you get a ton of alarms you know I guarantee you you go to any suitably complicated CNC or otherwise machine tool you will find at least one timer relay and a myriad of regular relays so it's important to know how to to troubleshoot this kind of stuff and if need be build this kind of stuff from scratch what kind of a guy has 14 alligator clip jumper wires just sitting around apparently I did I wouldn't be surprised if there's at least 10 more floating around here somewhere thanks for watching I guess we'll do this as bonus footage. I almost forgot to talk about the scenario that inspired me to make this video and this, this whole apparatus here. So one of my customers has an old fellows gear shaper. I'll throw a picture up so you can see what it looks like. It's basically a vertical stroking shaper that's designed specifically for cutting gear teeth. And the whole thing is kind of controlled by a big cam and the cam sort of sets the depth of the cutter it takes a, a rough pass and then a, a finish pass and then a fine finish pass or whatever anyway when it gets to the end the cam has a kind of a divot in it and it kicks the tool out of the work and then it also allows this limit switch to close and when the limit switch closes it's supposed to shut down the motor for the machine this is an old shaper he thinks it was built either in 1950 or 1951 so originally, all this jazz would have been controlled by a mechanical timer counter system, and then it had a, a contactor, motor starter, like this. He wanted to replace all that and go to a variable frequency drive. So I had to figure out how to incorporate this limit switch into the variable frequency drive. And I was actually able to do it without adding anything to the VFD. So we used a Hitachi VFD, it's a WJ200 series VFD, one horsepower, and it actually has a built in relay. Look, this relay right here. And what I was able to do was I figured out how to get the run and the stop, you know, push buttons to work to make the motor start and stop. That wasn't a problem. What I did is I just assigned that relay to close whenever the VFD was basically in run, so whenever the motor was running but it allows you to do an on delay so I set up a 45 second a 45 second on delay for that relay so when you push the start button the motor starts spinning and then 45 seconds later it closes the contacts in this relay and by giving it 45 seconds it's given it time actually the cam goes this way not that way by giving it 45 seconds it gives time for the cam to rotate far enough to basically push this limit switch open and there's no signal running up to this run allowed terminal and then when it gets all the way to the end of its stroke the limit switch kicks back out and it closes this contact goes through the relay which is now closed and basically gives a signal that stops allowing the run signal so it basically shuts down the VFD so I thought that was pretty cool it's just like 
this scenario here, you know, where the limit switch has a certain amount of, of distance to travel before it actually opens up, and you have to have some time to allow that opening to occur. That's why we use the on delay. And yeah, in this case, I was actually able to program it right into the VFD, almost like a little, like a little PLC built into the VFD itself. So I thought I would mention that kind of a cool application for an on-delay relay, but in this case it was actually built into a variable frequency drive.